Hello everybody, it's Grandmama. Time for another story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwack. Needle Threading. Hello there. We're going back about 20 years tonight to a phenomenon that could only have been found in America in the late 1920s or early 1930s. It sounds a little silly to us today, but in those hectic days it was routine. And while we joke about it and made light of everything like it, we went in for it and made it part of an era of the flappers and bootleggers and speakeasies and Sunday drivers. It's difficult to describe the late 1920s to youngsters who never lived them. And if they could go back to them and see the way we turned the world upside down to be different, to get ahead of the rest, to keep up with the times, they'd probably describe it in one world. Crazy and corny. They're both probably right. Flagpole sitters were the craze and newspapers pushed the New York stock crisis off the front pages to make room for Shipwreck Kelly's latest flagpole sitting record. Walkathons and dance-a-thons were called entertainment, and the residents of Aberdeen, Dave Lyon, had his picture in the newspaper all over the Northwest for being able to walk continuously for more than 72 hours. He claimed the world championship for continuous walking. Others were trying to play the piano longer than anyone else without stopping, or as the resident of Yakima, to make the world's biggest apple pie. And then came along George Gates of Aberdeen to throw the whole Northwest into a tizzy over a new one that he thought up. Now, before we get into deep in this yarn, which describes it more closely than you think, let's take the customary few words from George Edgar that brings us a message from our sponsor. Now, if you recall the last months of 1929, You'll remember the sudden drop-off in building construction that came with the drop in the stock market. Building, which had boomed on the harbor for the late, late years of the 20s, suddenly dropped away to nothing. The lumber market went flatter than yesterday's waffle, and our whole economy seemed to go to pieces. No one realized it in December 1929 that the town's profits made eloquent predictions of the great year for 1930. The town's financiers predicted that the stock crash would be the best thing that ever happened and people generally sat back to wait the coming of better times. Now in those days of teeming activity, people weren't content just sitting to wait. They got around to that later in the decade. But in 1930, they wanted to do something. And in January 1930, as the 10 years of uncertainty began, the Aberdeen plasterers named George S. Gates founded, found himself a new hobby. Plastering had stopped when building went flat, and Gates had plenty of time to sit around the house and think, and one day he watched his wife threading a needle. With a Harper's number 4 needle and a piece of number 50 cotton thread, she was wetting the tip and poking at one end through the eye and squinting down the crooked thread as a target and he volunteered to take over the job of threading her needles. Simple enough, lots of men get quite a feel for accomplishment of threading a needle, and George Gates did, and he found that, although his hands were used to fill the plaster trowel, and threading needles was pretty fine work compared to hoisting a scoop of plaster up onto a ceiling, he could thread a needle right well, and he became the official needle threader in the family. And once he was vested in the office, he took it seriously. Being a man who took pride in his work, he threaded large needles and small needles and studied the techniques of needle threading. And he found that he could put more than one thread through the eye of a needle by using a little trick. In fact, he could put several threads through. One evening, when things were quiet, and he, was, he had a running start, he shoved 21 number 
50 cotton threads through the eye of a Harper's number four needle. And the neighbors saw it. Friends began to talk. How many threads can you put through the eye of the needle? Well, how many? The word went around about George's, George Gates and how he had poked 21 through. And the local newspaper, which was scraping the bottom of the barrel for news, picked up the phenomenon and front page newsed it. It looked like the world's record. And the scribe pointed out that while other cities might have flagpole sitters and peanut rollers, Aberdeen had George Gates and the Needle Threading Championship of the World. And of course, that awakened the old competition between Hoquiam and Aberdeen. Charles Renio was a carpenter living in Hoquiam, and like Gates, with building pretty quiet. He had time on his hands, so he sat down and poked 30 number 50 cotton threads through the eye of a number four Harper's Needle and claimed the world's championship. And throughout the Northwest, the newspapers and radios began to trumpet the tidings. The world's champion needle threaders are on Grays Harbor. The results were all over the state of Washington. People began to thread needles with a determination they used to have for world championships. In Puyallup, Lois McAlby put 65 threads through the eye of a needle and sent the needle to Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce as evidence but it was thrown out as a darning needle and not eligible. In Tacoma, Marion Ryder slipped 52 threads through the needle's eye only to learn that he had used the wrong kind of needle. Back in Somerville, Massachusetts, Samuel Exon took the right needle and the right thread and put 28 and threw threads through the end without effort. The newswires of the nation had now taken it up and from coast to coast, the story of the newest craze, and craze it was, flashed across the front pages. Now, it was a very cold January in 1930. The snow piled deep and the days were the kind to keep people inside, which gave them lots of time to do things that they hadn't done before, which of course, in Grace Harbor, was to thread the most needles through the eye of a needle. Seattle entertained E. Buchanan at 3231 Chicago Avenue, but the best the big city entered could go to was 21 threads and the Grace Harbor Slickers, who had managed to run their string above 30, laughed at Seattle's puny entry and went right on poking at the needle's eye with their wet cotton strings. Ellen Olson of Renton entered a needle threading contest with 21 threads through its eye and sent it to the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce and George Gates laughed and poked four more threads through the eye without flinching. By this time every Chamber of Commerce in the state was trying to turn up a needle threader to beat the record held in Grays Harbor between Gates and Renio. But the Grays Harbor contenders for the world's crown grew more apt and kept pushing their record up. 31, 32, 33 threads went through the official needles and none could do better. Gates would spend hours working with his needle and one more thread, trying to lift the record by one more. And finally, the newswire fairly sang as the determined plaster pushed his 44 thread through the eye to lead all contestants. By this time, the craze was beginning to taper off, and there was less excitement when, Gage, when Gates ran his total up to the number 35. From Seattle came the claim that Harper's number four needles were obsolete and not obtainable on the market. Others claimed that Gates had soaked the thread in oil and stretched it to make it smaller. But the climax came a few days later, in the last days of January 1930, when Fred Hampson, a newspaper man, and today a writer of national importance, took a needle into Aberdeen's Chamber of Commerce office with 80 threads through its eye. The officials tabulated, counted them over and over again. They were all right, 80 threads. But as observers noted, there was room for another 80. 
for Hamster had substituted a sailmaker's needle for the approved Harper's number no. 4 needle, and everyone who could put a hundred threads through the needle it was a piker. But it broke the spell of the craze, and the people laughed at themselves and each other, and everyone enjoyed it greatly, including the Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce, which had shown brightly in the spotlight for its needle threading promotion that started with George Gates and got to wondering about the mechanics and the threading the needles for his wife and started a craze that swept over the nation. The gay 1920s had their high points and their low points and it was a short slide from the sublime to the ridiculous in that lustrous era and Grace Harbor which rose to an industrial peak in the years of the 1920s had dropped to an all-time economic low in the hungry 1930s, played the game for all that it was worth. And there is probably no better example of the harbor's love of competition and desire for a place in the sun than the spotlight it turned on the citizen George Gates when he distinguished himself in the eyes of the nation by setting the needle threading record back in the cold days of January 1930. He provided a lot of laughs for a nation that was sorely in need of a touch of humor at that moment and found himself a page tonight in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.